This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Football is a sport that I love. And let's consider on the football pitch, there are 23 people during a game with two or three other people nearby running up and down the sidelines or being on the edge of the pitch. I'm talking here about the 22 players and the three to four officials, not the coaches, nor the substitutes. So I'd pose this question, who has the most demanding job on that pitch? Some might say the goalkeeper, but I'd say it's actually the referee. This has to be the hardest role in football. And it's a job which rarely gets any praise. Certainly from the terraces, from fans, you're hardly ever going to get that, ooh, the referee had a great game today. A referee having a good performance, some would say, is when you don't actually notice them as a spectator. So yeah, refereeing to me is a fascinating topic and something that links very closely to mental toughness. And actually, it's something that I did consider at one time. As a youngster, I took some refereeing exams. Sadly, though, I didn't follow through with that and go on actually take any games. I decided it wasn't for me. I think that was down to, to my lack of confidence at the time. And from this episode, what I've noticed is it takes a special type of person to referee. Someone who's very assertive. Someone who's very assertive in these really demanding moments, these pressurised moments. It's someone who can take criticism and a lot of it. It's someone who can handle abuse. And again, very sadly, a lot of that. So in this episode, I'm going to be chatting to Nathan Sherritt, a referee and a resilience trainer. And we're going to go on to talk about his love of the job, how he goes on to manage his confidence, the challenges that referees face, and his work with the third team. Enjoy the episode. So Nathan, how do you define mental toughness in refereeing terms? I think uh, what, I, what I tend to think about when I think about mental toughness in, in, in refereeing terms is that I tend to think about the uh, the ability to basically deal with the challenges that are being you know, placed upon you. So you, you think about players appealing for decisions, you think about players trying to get that little five or 10% advantage by trying to make you question your decision-making and things like that. And I, and I think that mental toughness, when it comes into that kind of thing, I think it's, um, I think it's basically the ability to deal with those things and the challenges mentally and physically when people are maybe surrounding you that, that get placed upon you. It's an interesting one. That way you talk about, I suppose, players trying to manipulate you and get, get into your head in some ways. How, how do you deal with that? I think you've just got to try and take a step back and take a deep breath and try and sort of survey the full picture to give yourself as much information as possible before you make any decisions and try to really take an objective view. And I think particularly if you are in a position where you can speak to one of your assistants or you're, you know, you've got a, a microphone and comms kit on just to maybe get a second opinion as well on a situation can, can really help. I think a lot of it's about perspective and trying to, understand the reality of the situations you're in so that you don't get sort of hook, line and sinker brought into something that's not what it should be. So in effect, what you're saying is if you're a referee, try and take your time over things, maintain your comp composure in some ways where you talked about breathing there and then obviously a, a second opinion. Yeah. It's, it's, it's got to be quite difficult to... Oh, it's got to be, have to be a, certainly a skill to be able to really control and manage your emotions and just not let events sort of take over in your own mind. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think it's 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 one of them things that you know we always say really we'd rather take a deep breath and uh, and slow it down and make sure we come to the right decision. And I think when we're working together in teams uh, as officials, we're always trying to think about you know, let's just take our time and let's get it right and let's not uh, be rushed into making the wrong decisions. So I think it's, I think a general rule, you know, in life really is a rush decision is more often 
than not a wrong decision. And I think you can you can certainly live by that when you when you're out refereeing. Uh, no, it makes sense. That does. The, you talk there about obviously refereeing in teams, so referees at a higher level are going to have that um, luxury. Yeah. But uh, yeah, a grassroots level, when you're out there by yourself, I can imagine that can be pretty um, daunting at times. It can be, and sometimes, you know, when you're out there on your own, you, you more often than not have a tendency to maybe want to kill a game a little bit and, and to try and uh, make your mark on it and put more uh, pressure on the game, so to speak, by, you know, maybe giving more free kicks and le- less advantages and things like that to actually stem the flow of the game because that's the best vehicle and the best best method to to actually um, maintain a good level of match control because ultimately your job is to keep everybody on that field safe and try and keep as many people on the field of play as possible. And I think if you've got a game where there's a high level of aggression or something like that, it, you're far better off making the game become a little bit more disjointed in terms of the flow, but it's more managed and, and more often than not, if you realise that the game's spiralling a little bit out of control and you put a much tighter grip on it, the players will maybe then get an understanding of what your expectations are and the way that you're going to work and know that they'll not get away with certain sort of, I don't want to say misconduct, but won't get away with aggression over, overly. And, and then what that allows you then to do is maybe later on in the game, you can loosen your grip on the game because you've you've set out your stall and your expectations to the players earlier on in the game. So what you've talked about there with the match control side of things, if if you are a young referee, if you're what, 15, 16, 17 years old, are these sort of principles, you know, discussed quite openly to you at that sort of age? Or do you have to just really learn it uh, as, as you go, as you, yeah, as you go? Yeah, I, th- I think you definitely do learn it. I think you learn it from working with higher ranked and more experienced colleagues, um, you know, and I think that um, mentors can be crucial in that regard as well because really a lot of it comes round, round to being how canny can you be, so to speak? How, canny, how, how much of a canny operator can you be in terms of those little little tricks of the trade, I suppose, that come with experience. And, and and you're only going to build that by working with people and understanding people and talking to people as much as possible because um, you need to to gain that experience. That's ultimately what makes you a better referee because it makes you understand the, the people that you, you're working with as, as players and, and the club officials and everybody much better. So it sounds like you're, you're always learning as a referee. You are always learning, you are, because... You know, there'll be times when you come into new situations with different teams in different areas. And then maybe as you progress, you're going to come up against a higher standard of come up against, not come up against, that's the wrong term. Maybe I should say you're going to be refereeing basically a higher standard of football and better players and things. And they'll have different expectations. So it's about always trying to meet the expectations that are placed upon you to deliver the best game you possibly can. But you've got me thinking now about the like the job of a referee from something you said a little bit earlier there because like from a fan's perspective, it's not yes. really something you, you you think about. But what in from a referee's perspective, what would you say is is your job? Well, I think I think you're right. I think nobody really grows up wanting to be a referee, uh, but I think that um, I think that I think your job your job your job is really to maintain control of the game and allow it to be the best um, version of that game that it possibly can be. But equally, you've got that um, responsibility that, that's really incumbent upon you in terms of the safety of the players and um, allowing you know, everybody to you know, feel like they're going to be involved in a fair game. And I think there's always, unfortunately a real pet hit of referees, but there's always a question about integrity. And I think um, that, you know, that's a real bugbear for referees. They don't take it particularly kindly, but at, at the same time, you've got to believe that 
you know everything you're doing is 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 the right thing for the game and 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 what you really I think ge- genuinely do you have to genuinely love football because it's tough at times you know in terms of the stick that you get and things like that but you've also got to genuinely love um that sense of I don't care who wins this I just want to enjoy this football match as a spectacle because you get the best seat in the house as a referee and you've got to appreciate that so you mentioned about love there so what is it that you love about refereeing it's a funny one and I think it's it's almost uh, intangible to actually explain it but I think um I think it's just that sense of 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 that balance and act of control and and things like that that you know uh, uh, and I think when you don't when you don't really have the ability to play like I don't uh, but you want to stay involved you know you love being involved because even referees get that buzz at five to three on a Saturday afternoon. I like that. I'm I'm going to take you back again to the 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 job bit that you you mentioned. So you said yeah. three things, right? And for any players that are listening to this and coaches, I think this is an important one. Yeah. So you said that you, you're looking to, in effect, make the game the best version of the game that it can be. Yeah. Then you've got the safety of the players. And yeah. you've also got fairness. Now, <laughs> lots of games that I watch, I don't really see um, players sort of thinking about safety often when you know bad tackles go in, when they when they lose their um, lose control of their emotions and they, they try yeah. to you know take out someone. Um, obviously, it doesn't happen every game, but but it can happen a lot. Fair game when they stand there and um, yell for. For throw-ins when it's blatantly uh, somebody else's yeah. throw-in, that that's got to be quite difficult as a referee to to be able to manage when you've got all these sort of shenanigans that go on. Players diving as well. You've got to think about how you want to control it, and you've got to set your stall out, and you've got to set your style out, and and decide who you are and what your personality is as a referee, because absolutely everybody's going to cheat to want to get an advantage. That's the nature of of the game and everybody wants to win and they want to win so badly that they may be a little bit liberal with the, the principles of the game. So I think, uh, I think it's really difficult sometimes, but you've got to have that single mindedness and that focus to, to really drill in and and dial in on uh, exactly what it is that you, um, you know, you, you want to do. So if, if, if you are focused and dialed in on a throw in, you're going to bang that arm out. You're going to make a strong signal and you're going to shut the players down. And that's what you've got to do at times. You've got to shut people down and show that authority and that leadership, because then people buy into your, you know, what you're, what you're doing. People trust you and believe that you make the right decision because your body language is one of certainty and, and really sells it. So you don't need to worry then too much about anything else. The part of mental toughness is interpersonal confidence. So being able to assert your authority, as you've as you've mentioned, is is obviously a key skill there that I would imagine most referees have got. So um, I suppose again, how how do you go about developing that? Well, I think it's an interesting one. Um, I think I think referees are no different to players. Uh, players will go, strikers will, will go for four or five games without a goal and start to worry and referees will have um, some games where, you know, they get blocked for tackles and they miss things and, they, you know, they just, the, 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 if you like, the ball's not bouncing for them, so to speak, where things become a little bit awkward. So I think, you know, these are one of the big these are these are the big challenges that that you do and, and I think to build it and boost it you might change the way that you referee um so if you are maybe uh in, in more in the grassroots and you're refereeing maybe on supply league level or contributory league level you might come off and you might do a youth game do a kids game to try and get a bit of confidence back because maybe the, the pace of the game's a little bit slower, the players are maybe a little less aggressive, 
it's more emphasis on development than winning. And doing things like that can give you a boost in confidence. It's a bit like, a, as I say, a striker, uh, it, you know, in a football team, if he hasn't scored for a few weeks, he might go and play for the reserves and see if he can get a goal against, you know, maybe younger players and things like that. So there's always things that you can do as a referee, I think, to try and, and boost that. But also, you know, you've got techniques like, you know, which I'm sure you know from sports psychology, you, you know, you can do things like recording tapes, which which motivate you that you can listen to maybe before you go out uh, to, to the middle and things like that. There's also, you know, many techniques like grounding and visualization, things like that, that you can do that will really um, boost you and make you feel more confident and, and, and relaxed before you, you go out there. So you're not fretting about what, what's going to be asked of you and what the demands are. Yeah, I can, I can see that actually how the, uh, the grounding is, is going to help you know and no end in order to remain calm. And then, yeah, visualisation, when you go on about body language and you using your arms, your signals, and and even just the way you communicate, I can see that can be a absolutely huge uh, and, a, and a really good skill for, for referees, especially... If they've been on the receiving end of abuse, um, have you have you been in that situation? Um, well, tough question, really, isn't it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think most referees who who have been refereeing for any period of time, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, faced something or other because it's a real occupational hazard. So, how, how do you deal with it? Well, I think, you know, you want to talk about mental toughness. You, you've got to have a pretty strong level of intrinsic mental toughness. That has to be said. You know, it's not for everyone. Um, but, but And so I think that, I think that it, 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 it's, a, it's a funny, funny pursuit refereeing because you have to be really, really motivated to want to improve and develop and you've got to really care about your refereeing and you've got to be dedicated because sometimes you're going to be making long journeys on a midweek night in winter when it's cold and wet and you've got to run around and, and it's not the most pleasant thing in the world. But at the same time, you've got to not care. You, you, you've got to care very, very little for what the players really um, think about you, what the players make of your decisions, everything like that. Y you have to... Um, just try and focus on what you're doing and believe in, in, in the decisions that you're making and, and not really care whether the players think you've had a good game or not. There's, there's quite um, quite a lot of similar similarities really with the, the athlete as well in some ways with the footballer, the, the golfer, the cricketer. The, yeah. I know certainly from people that support, the amount of people that worry about what their teammates think, what the opposition thinks, what the what the coaches are thinking, scouts are thinking, and then they get completely distracted. It's you know, I suppose it's very similar in that way. And often I see in sport how people care so much that they they're just they're not able to maintain control of what they're yeah. trying to do and focus like in on the moment mm -hmm. and the, and their process. So there's yeah, I can see there's. They are very striking similarities there. Um, you mentioned about the the dedication aspect as well, and in the winter, and obviously, you know, if you are common common abuse there and uh, having some difficult periods, it must be yeah. quite difficult for a lot of referees who are managing careers as well as refereeing at times just to to manage their energy levels in order so that they, they can focus at a hundred percent. I can see how, you know, if you're tired or you've had a, you know, had a bad day at work, it'd be quite easy just to be a little bit off the pace. And then before you know it, you've, you've made a mistake. Um, and you know, you've given a penalty or a, you haven't given an offside or something like that. There'll be something fans and I imagine coaches don't really take into account. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that you get a lot of players who, try to um i think take advantage of these situations sometimes because they can maybe sometimes see when you're not quite at it which is why i think you've got to be really strong you've got to be really resilient outwardly 
um, to to think about the way that you come across because I think there's a lot of challenges that come with referee. And as I said, you know, you're sometimes going to be traveling a lot of miles um, whilst working a full-time job and things like that. Um, and maybe having a family and um, and everything as well. And all those responsibilities that come with that. So I think that um, it can be really, really difficult at times. And what I think is really important is that you, you can almost uh, take on board the mentality of I don't really care what happens, um, you know, or what is going on, I should say, in my life, you know, outside of this football pitch for these 90 minutes, I'm I'm concentrating solely on on the job that I have to do. And I think that that's, that's really, really important for, um, for you as a, as a referee, because you need to be able to, concentrate and give it your entire focus on you know the game and, and everything you do and you, you can't be uh on a Saturday afternoon for example looking at your watch with five minutes to go running down the pitch thinking I'm wondering what I'm going to have for me dinner when I get home you've got to concentrate on everything right to the very end right from the very beginning you know I've refereed games where I've sent players off in the first minute because they've they've come into the game too hot-headed wanting to prove a point and they've ended up doing something stupid. And very much the same thing can happen towards the end of a game if a team's been humiliated and, and a player gets frustrated. Something big, a flashpoint can happen even 30 seconds before the final whistle. So you've got to be right on it from minute one to minute, whatever it is, without a time at, at the end of the game. So in a way, self-care is a, a massive thing there. Um, out of interest, you know, do you want to tell the listeners how you keep yourself um, sane and, you know, in in control of yourself. So if you're not feeling good. Yeah, I think that probably when I think about particularly my match day technique and things like that, a lot of it's actually about forgetting about the football. So yeah, okay, maybe two or three days before I'll do my homework on the teams and I'll look at that. But then on the day of the game, um, I'm going to feel relaxed and, and, and everything and I want to feel relaxed. So I'm, I'm not thinking about football or anything like that. I'm, I'm probably listening to music in the car and switching off and just, you know, um, looking around while I'm driving at the different places I'm visiting and things like that, rather than getting absorbed in thinking, right, I don't know what, I wonder what this captain's going to be like and da 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 and all this. You've done your preparation. You need to be relaxed and, 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 and almost mellow, I think, really, before you arrive. And then when you, I think when you arrive, you can start to tune up your focus a bit towards the game and because you've got you, you've had that basis and that that foundation of being relaxed and then you've tuned your focus in you should be ready to give a, a fairly decent performance I think after that yeah so in some ways you you end up just going on the pitch and just trusting that you've you've got your A game in effect and yeah. you can do the job yeah. but in order to get to that point you're going to need downtime through the week, though, when you yeah. you're working hard and you 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 referee. And what what do you do to switch off? Well, I like to do other things and, and things with probably a little bit more of a sedate pace. Like when I play golf with my friends and things like that, I think they're really good things because they stay active and they're social and you you're switching off, but you still you get to enjoy the company of other people and things like that. And it makes you helps you forget about some of the pressures and the demands of things because. There's no doubt that you, you you can be daunted at times by uh, the thought of a game on on a weekend, or uh, you can be daunted by the pressure of of trying to get promotion as a referee or anything like that. So it's entirely possible that that kind of thing can happen. This is a short advertisement introducing the sponsor for the show, Chimera Sport, who produce a range of sportswear and equipment to help enhance performance and recovery, reducing injury occurrences. And as someone who has had long-standing back issues, I've personally tested some of the garments and I've been more than happy with them. You'll also find that the infrared sportswear has been clinically tested too. So it's great for fitness enthusiasts who want to push harder, go further and recover quicker. More details can be found on the product section of our website and in the show notes. So Nathan, you run a successful business, it's called The Third Team, yeah. it supports referees. Um, I can see from the conversation that we've we've had 
like why it is so successful. Um, do you want to just share with the listeners, you know, how you go about supporting referees in that respect with the third team? I think, um, yeah, the, I think one of the biggest things that we try to do is we we want we want to work with with groups of referees and try to embrace the power of referees as much as possible, particularly when we deliver workshops. I think that when we do workshops, that the basis is 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 very much around you know how can we uh, use the power of the room, so to speak. So we, we we've got maybe got a group of referees in a room, which obviously hasn't been so much possible over the last couple of years, but hopefully now is going to be possible that we can. Um, take everybody's experience because I think when you're working with a group of referees, okay, the fundamentals are, are very much the same. We've all had similar experiences as referees being out in the middle and things like that. And it's about harnessing that and, and, and really almost being vulnerable with, it, with with these workshops where we have that honesty of saying, actually, you know, I, I've always struggled with that. And I'm glad he said that he struggles with that because that helps me to understand that it's not just me. Uh, you know, there's also other other aspects to that. So I think that that's, that's really, really important to think about. I think that when we support referees on a more one-to-one situation, I think it's a little bit more about um, the work that we can do with them is about giving them that, that little bit of confidence and those that, that belief that they can do well. Because I think more often than not, that's where referees, I think, are suffering crises of confidence. Things like not being able to sleep before a game, things like not feeling supported through a game and things like that. So I think that we try to help them with a more individual challenges when it when it comes to that and um i think we're just trying to support referees in as many different ways as possible now and and almost produce materials as well which can help them and, and we get some great feedback on that as well that sounds like you're doing some fantastic work there it strikes me it's quite quite an interesting one where you you know you talked about vulnerable there and i've got a i've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about this at the moment um mm-hmm. because in sport there just seems to be a a thing certainly in professional sport where people don't realize actually the athletes out there they're human beings after all yeah. and obviously like mental health's been talked about quite a bit now in sport and people are showing their vulnerabilities the perception of referees is potentially from the outside is is certainly um not a one of where where they show vulnerability but i'm guessing from what you're saying yeah that does happen in the the types of work that you do in these workshops yeah, it definitely does. And I think that, you know, the referees are just the same as players. They want to be the best that they can be. Um, and they really care about what they do and the time that they put in. And I think you have to care because if you're committing that level of time to to doing something like being a referee, you need to, to really care about it. So I think they've got a lot of vulnerability in terms of wanting to do really well and, and it puts pressure on them and it, it exposes uh, some maybe some weaknesses that they've got that they can always improve on because you know what what we always say mental toughness is a is a scale and it's something that we can go up and down on and, and we do regularly go up and down on given how you know factors around our lives are changing you know we can we can get a big boost when we're in love or we have a wedding or we have a baby or we have whatever it might be but we can also have a real down when somebody dies or we lose a job or we uh, you know somebody's ill you know things like that can really have that effect because there's many things that are really important in people's lives that dictate everything else that goes on in their lives you know you've got to work every day and do your job but ultimately there are many other factors and assets and and facets to your life that mean whether you're good or not you know you might get a really uh, big bill to repair your car which brings you down you know and, and things like that can can have a massive impact, maybe for a day, maybe for a week, maybe for a month. But these things can massively have an impact upon you and change the outlook that you have when you go to work and do your job. And obviously, when we're talking about working in this sense, we're talking about your refereeing career. Yeah, and no, thanks for sharing that that human side to, to referees. And again, I hope uh, players and coaches t- try and take that on board from, from this episode. Now, I'm really impressed by your, your work. Um, I've noticed you, you're coming to a... A big celebration, I think it is, isn't it? 100 blogs. Um, you, you're involved with the Final Whistle podcast where you've you've interviewed a range of like top line guests, to yeah. say the least. Um, you know, from those little experiences, what would you say you, you've learned the most from? I think that um, actually, you know, really what, what we're saying, linking what we just said before there about human side and things like that. I think what, it, what it's allowed me to do is understand people on a human level a lot more 
and and what we're talking about is we're talking about really high performing people, people who are doing really really well and and have achieved the top level of their professions. But what we're talking about them is we're talking about them on a human level, and we're talking about the fact that you know um, I'm from the northeast of England, as are you, David, and we interviewed Mark Clattenburg, who obviously. Uh, has been the, the number one referee in the world to referee the Champions League final, the European Championships final, and the FA Cup final all in one year. He's been at the real pinnacle. But at the end of the day, we had him on the on the podcast, and we're talking about you know refereeing at places like Tau Law, where, where I referee, where he refereed at the beginning of his career. And you know these people are not from another planet. You know they're not made out of special materials. They're just as human as the rest of us, and they have those. We talk about vulnerabilities. They've got those vulnerabilities and things like that. So I think that what what doing things like that has, has allowed us to really drill in on is the fact that we've had high achieving people. We had a, a really good guest on on the final whistle, Adam Adam Penwell, who was an extremely promising referee and was told he was an extremely promising referee that had real potential, but had bad injuries. and And we interviewed him in in one episode, and we really got to the heart of how difficult that it had been for him. And he got really emotional about the end of his career and that he'd never been to that place before, before we did that interview. So I think that, you know, we've been, we've been really successful in getting to the heart of the human parts of these people. And I think that that's what has the real interest for people because it makes people see a way to the top because they see the more human side of how that person's got to the top, but also makes them realize that, you know, if they're refereeing on, on, on Hackney marshes on a Saturday afternoon and they're having some struggles that, you know, the top, top guys have been there and had those struggles as well. So I think that that's really important. And I think with the blog, the blog's been a wonderful tool because it's so well received and I get such wonderful feedback and it comes out every Friday at five o'clock and, and, and that's by design, you know? The design is that you want to read a, a blog which is going to give you a tip to take into your game on a Saturday or a Sunday before the weekend starts. So you know, we've done that and that we've had some wonderful, wonderful feedback. It really makes a difference to people. I know that we've got a loyal readership and um, and that the, the people really, really care. And, and I have to thank um, the sponsors as well, Yes Ref, who've been wonderful with it. And, and we've done an awful lot with them and we're really delighted about our partnership with them. Um, and they've funded the blog as well, which is great. And we're just absolutely delighted about doing as much as we possibly can with the blog going forward and really excited to get this milestone because, you know, it was Friday, the 6th of September, 2019, the first edition went out and that's a hundred consecutive weeks that we've produced a blog now. So I'm absolutely delighted with that. You know, what an achievement that is for us um, to get there, to keep going. And I think that, you know, I can't wait to, to get right with the next hundred and, and hopefully uh, reach an even bigger audience because the audience is growing exponentially all the time. And, um, you know, I can't wait to reach more referees in more territories and, and help more referees in more territories as well. And that's not just with the workshops that we're doing and the one-to-one sessions that we want to do. It's also um, with the blog and giving more referees in more different leagues, more tips before they go out to referee of, of a weekend. Yeah, I've read quite a bit of your content and, uh, yeah, I'll, I love them they're great um you know a lot of the things that you share like really resonate with me so yeah, thank you love the good work um 100 blogs um i know what it's like i've you know, got a, a similar figure it takes um some determination and some some mental toughness along the way to say the least yeah definitely yeah yeah especially on the days that you you don't necessarily want to be writing it or the way you just yeah. want to be a bit of a, a cozy week um but uh you yeah, know hats off to you well done with that I definitely think writer's blog can set in in the times and, and sometimes you'll write it really, really quickly um, and the words will just dance on the page and it'll flow. F- but you, but sometimes you do get writer's block and it takes you twice or three times as long to write it. So it's been a very much a, a mixed experience of doing it, but ultimately the, the reward that you get at the end of it. And I think that one of the things I've observed, uh, there's no method or rhyme or reason to really the way that these blogs are, are received, you know. Sometimes you'll think you've you've written a really good one and it'll fall completely flat on its face. And one time you'll think, oh, that's just an average blog, but I'm I'm just pleased that we've got a blog out and it'll be one of the best received that you've had. So I think that you can never um, you know, fully judge exactly how things are going to be received and the methods 
and the messages that are going to be put across from each one that you do, you just got to do your best and, and hope that they're all, um, you know, make a difference to someone. Yeah, I suppose everybody's different as well, isn't it? Every reader's different. Some will like it, some won't. Um, somebody might be picking it up in a bad mood or a good mood. Yeah, um, it, yeah it is the way it is. But but ultimately, you've got a yeah, you've got a nice library of content there, and yeah, I can see you. Yeah, you're definitely helping people. So yeah, again, well done to you. Um, so you know, should people want to reach out to you and have a conversation, whereabouts uh, can they get in touch with you, Nathan? Well, I think the best way to probably get in touch with me is. Uh, by visiting the website thirdteam.co.uk we've got a contact page there i'm also available on linkedin and the third team has pages on linkedin uh, facebook instagram and twitter Um, we also have the video content that myself and the third team are involved in on the third team's youtube channel so we're very easily contactable and our contact uh, content uh, content is very uh, easily uh, accessible and, and readable and, and viewable and watchable and, and whatever else so we've got um we've got a really good uh basis and uh yeah we're just uh quite accessible th- thankfully i think to a lot of referees who want to reach out and get support brilliant well it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you i um, really grateful for your time there nathan yeah really enjoyed it so yeah big thank you thanks for having me david That was brilliant. I really enjoyed chatting to Nathan. Thought I knew a lot about refereeing and the psychological side to refereeing, but some of the things that Nathan came up with, well, they really opened my eyes. And that's what it's all about, certainly on this podcast. It's about opening your eyes to the world of mental toughness. It's very easy today to be educated from sources that aren't particularly helpful. So I'm on a mission, a big mission, to make sure that this is not the case during this podcast, that the podcast is run professionally, yet in a relaxed way, that it challenges your thinking, and that you actually recognise that mental toughness is quite complex, that it's simply not about just getting your head down or about manning up, as people might say. And as far as refereeing goes, Nathan must be a special type of person. Referees are certainly a special bunch how they go on to manage criticism and abuse to the extremes and remain in control of their emotions, not letting their confidence levels get affected. It amazes me at times, especially when they're manipulated the way they are by players diving around and and then we haven't even factored in their outside lives. That's right, referees are human beings after all, and they've got to try and remain in control of their lives whilst making decisions on the football pitch in difficult circumstances sometimes. So as Nathan alluded, a lot of referees are very dedicated and very committed to their craft, to the job that they love. So for sports fans, for football fans, I'd like you just to remember this, that referees and officials, as well as the players, are actually human beings. They're not robots. Things actually do happen to them in their lives. And in your life this week, I really hope that some good things happen. And I look forward to sharing with you another excellent conversation and a fun conversation with a top guest next week. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport Hyphen Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.